Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the October edition of our construction webinar series, coming to you live here from uh, Lois Law Firm. My name is Tashia Rasul. I'm a partner here at Lois, where I oversee the defense of uh, workers' comp claims that arise out of construction accidents. If you've been watching me over the past couple of years, thank you for following me and being here today. If today's your first webinar, thank you and welcome. Um, we're coming down to the end of the year. We're going to wrap this year up with some, um, some coverage issues and uh, towards the end of the year, we'll talk about some case law that we saw that impacted construction claims um, this year and what we expect for next year. Today, we are going to talk about um, coverage issues that come up in construction claims. There are so many issues that come up, especially since um, the grand majority of them are wrap-ups, the OSIPs and the CSIPs. Uh, we'll talk about who's covered under a policy, what kinds of coverage disputes are in the workers' comp claims, and don't forget, this is a live, uh, live session, so at the end, you can type your question into the box that looks like this, and hopefully it'll pop up in my end and I'll provide you with a response. If we run out of time, I will be sure to uh, send you an email or if you leave your number, I'll give you a call and we can talk about your particular question on um, any given coverage issue. So let's get into it. Coverage, so as you know, the um, the workers' compensation policy is the one that's really liable when there is a workers' compensation claim, whether it be an operational policy or a wrap-up policy, which could be an OSIP, an owner-controlled insurance policy, or a CSIP, which is a contractor-controlled insurance policy. Now, in New York State, because of the big constructions that are going on, uh, the grand majority of them are covered under a wrap-up policy of some kind where there is a common owner or contractor and usually a common carrier in both the workers' comp side and the general liability side. Now, we are oftentimes dragged into these uh, coverage disputes because, quite honestly, it's because of the board's uh, lack of understanding of how coverage works. Um, in these construction claims, how wrap-up policies work. And um, I mean, I, I have to say, the, the way the board does its investigation also of these coverage issues, when they pull up the potential carriers, they just pick the first one and it's not the appropriate one. It's, not, it's either not the operational policy or it's either for, the, um, for, for a job site that's not covered. And then we are dragged into litigation for months at a time trying to get out of it. So what exactly do we need to know about these wrap-ups and what exactly does your defense counsel need in order to defend against them? Those are some of the things we're going to address today. So who's covered under the wrap-up? Enrolled contractors. If you're not enrolled, you're not covered. In the wrap-up uh, situation, there are um, Procedures for uh, being enrolled into a project. Paperwork have to be filled out, completed, approved. Um, if you're not enrolled, you wouldn't be covered under the wrap-up policy. Now, some examples of non-enrolled contractors on the job sites. Um, generally, those under a certain number of hours, under a certain number of, uh, under a certain uh, contract value, Hazardous materials vendors like asbestos removal generally is not covered. Uh, demolition is not covered in a lot of um, uh, wrap-ups. We've seen like elevator is sometimes not covered. It all depends on what the program is and what's being written into the policy. But at the end of the day, we have to think about who's actually enrolled, who was accepted into the program. The other thing to keep in mind is an enrolled contractor might be there for just a particular kind of work, but even though they're on the job site before or after them or doing a different kind of work, doesn't mean they're enrolled. Again, we have to go back to the enrollment terms and see why exactly they were authorized to be on the job site. So maybe they were there for uh, carpentry, that's what they're enrolled for, but they also specialize in electrical work, but they were not enrolled for electrical work. 
if an accident occurs during the time that they're there doing the electrical work, they would not be covered on your wrap up. So that's something to be taken into consideration. What exactly are they on the job site for? And what exactly are they enrolled for? Now, what exactly is covered under wrap up? So it's for a specific project or projects. There are specific parameters, whether it be um, streets and avenue that's sometimes laid out in the policy or the name of a building, for example, a bank or a transportation hub. But even with that, the address of the location is specific in the policy. And it's also for a specific time period. Um, it's, it's not forever. It's only from either the beginning to the end of the project or the beginning to the end of the phase or during the time that the work is expected to be done. So um, the policies do have a start or end date, start and end date just like a regular policy also. So the coverage issues that arise. As I indicated earlier, we are pulled into a lot of litigation regarding coverage. Um, so many make the assumption that all work and contractors are covered. The judges do this, the adversary do this, as long as we have a policy for John Smith construction, they're like, oh yeah, you cover this. No, 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 that's not, a, that's not how it works, right? We have to be very specific about the location did the accident occur at a location that we covered? Okay, who was the claimant's employer? Were they enrolled? Were they not enrolled? That's how we make a determination as to who exactly is covered and when we actually, whether we actually have coverage for the accident. So we have the non, the enrolled or the non-enrolled contractors. This is something we're still educating the board and our adversaries about. They don't quite understand what it means to be enrolled or not enrolled. Um, so this is an argument that we oftentimes make, especially when the contractor is not enrolled. We see this a lot with um, asbestos removal companies that are on the job site. And I will say that one of the, their defenses is, well, we were there, we are an asbestos removal company, but we're not doing asbestos removal. So this also goes back to, okay, why exactly were you on the job site? right? Were you there for asbestos removal? Did the claimant sustain an accident while engaging in asbestos removal? If so, your operational policy should cover because that's not covered. If you were there for something else, let's say carpentry, that's something else that you do, and the claimant sustained an injury while involved in doing, doing the carpentry work, okay, next we have to see whether you're actually enrolled for carpentry work. Again, if not, then your operational policy should be covering. The date of loss. The date of loss is very important. Um, oftentimes we see a date of loss that's outside of the period of enrollment or outside of the policy period. So we have to be very, very careful to see what the date of loss that's being claimed against our policy or against the period of time that the, the contractor is actually enrolled um, on the project. Something else we have to take into consideration is like what, what exactly is the work that they're doing? Because for example, um, we might be beyond the electrical phase and um, the claimant is now claiming a date of loss that's outside of that phase. The employer is no longer on site. They're obviously no longer covered because all of the electrical work has been done. But if you just look at it from a bird's eye view, we might want to say, oh wait, the employer was enrolled, so they should be covered. But we have to be peculiar about the date of loss of the accident, because if the accident occurred at a time when the, 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 the contractor was not enrolled in the program, then we have to look into things like, why was the claimant there? Why was the employer still there? Was it for another um, enrolled project? Should it be the operational policy? So we have to develop the record by cross-examining the claimant and providing as many documentation as possible to defend against that. The phases of the project that I mentioned, it could be the demolition, electrical, uh, the roofing, carpentry, whatever the phase of the project is. Um, that has to be taken into consideration also. Accidents that occur off the job site. So we've had a great deal of these this year 
where the accidents do not occur within the parameters of the project. So it's on the street outside of the, outside of the project. We've had a couple of cases where they're in a motor vehicle accident, claiming that they're on their way to work or leaving work. That gives rise to two issues, the coming going rule, and also whether coverage should be with the wrap up or the operational policy. So that if it is found to be uh, compensable under the go going coming rule, should it be the wrap up that's covering or should it be the operational policy that's actually covering this? We actually have a pending case at the third department of that issue. I can't wait to see how they're gonna come back and rule. Hopefully by the end of next year, we'll get an answer. We'll definitely be reporting on that issue. Um, occupational and repetitive injury claims, the wrap up versus the uh, operational. So for a short period of time, the board was finding that the operational policies um, should be liable for occupational repetitive injuries. They have since overturned that decision. We are still fighting to get a decision in our favor because quite frankly, if the claimant has been working for the same employer for 30 years and he's an hour wrap up job site for five days and that's his last exposure, why should a wrap up policy be liable for that repetitive injury claim if it's found that you know the last exposure, the date of disablement is when he last worked there? It should be the employer's um, operational policy. It just makes sense. It's more logical that way. So that's a fight we're still fighting. We're still trying to get the judges to understand um, the concept here and we're still looking for the perfect case to um, appeal and take to the third department to hopefully make case law that's in favor of all of the construction clients, those who have the wrap-up or under the wrap-up program. Um, then we see section 56 issues. Uh, WCL section 56 uh, pr pretty much says that if uh, an employer does not have workers' compensation insurance liability is going to travel up to the general contractor on the job site. So let's just say uh, John Smith Construction subcontracted to ABC Construction and for some reason ABC Construction does not have um, workers' compensation, it would travel up to the general contractor, John Smith Construction. So this is something we also have to look and see whether it's a wrap-up situation or an operational policy situation. Would uh, John Smith Construction's coverage under the wrap-up be liable for this, or are we pointing our fingers to the operational policy? So generally, if um, John Smith is covered under the wrap-up policy and there's a Section 56 liability issue, it would travel up to the wrap-up policy, and they would be liable for um, claims under Section 56. <clears throat> How to prepare to handle these coverage disputes. Now, we have to know who the policy covers, right? We cannot go to a hearing or go into litigation not having the complete policy. Something that we always do from the very inception is request a policy that's been placed in notice, file it with the board, review the policy, analyze it, see what additional information we need. We also need to know what exactly the policy covers. These are things like, kind of work or the kind of workers that it actually covers. Know what the claim is for. I know this seems very basic, but we should know what exactly the claimant is claiming. The example I gave earlier, was he injured while doing asbestos work or was he injured doing carpentry work? His company specializes in both, but is only enrolled for one, the carpentry work. Which one exactly was he injured doing? Um, Getting all the policy documents in order, so this would include any kind of addendum or addenda or the binder documents, which are generally not provided to us by the insurance carrier, but it's always good to talk to an underwriter to try to get those documents. Um, the enrollment documents, that's something that's not included with the policy. The client has to give you that information. It's generally an Excel sheet with all of the, the, the entire with a list of all of the enrolled contractors on the job site, um, one of the uphill battles that we face with that is if we don't have someone to testify with regards to the enrollment, the enrollment log, um, it, it, it could be held against us because it's 
an Excel document, it's a live document, and questions arise as to who edits this, when was this, when was it last edited? So we definitely need a witness to authenticate um, the process and the document to show either the enrolled contractor um, was there for a particular job, particular period, or this is the list of the enrolled contractors from the, in, um, the inception of the project. Uh, John Smith contracting was never um, on, on this list. They're not enrolled. They're not covered under the policy. Um, we should also line up our underwriter to testify with regards to the policy. Once in a while, we come across a policy that's a little bit vague, um, doesn't have the specific location or the exact address of the location that's covered, so we would need an underwriter to come in and testify regarding that. You should get all of this information and provide it to your defense counsel or upload it to the board file prior to the very first hearing. We have to start making the arguments from the very first day. The judges are inclined to keep uh, additional carriers and notice until the coverage issue is resolved, until the proper carrier appears. Some of them drag you into the trial, but we need to be fighting because you're paying me unnecessarily, you're paying your defense counsel unnecessarily to go to these hearings to defend against coverage when there's clearly no coverage by your policy. So it should be teed up the very first hearing. Let's not sit back and wait until the trial comes around to produce all of these documentation. We've had success with judges listening to our arguments as long as all of our documents are in the file to support our position, even before we get to the trial or before the proper carrier is even placed in notice. Side note, if you are the only carrier notice, the judge will keep you in until additional carriers are placed on notice because they don't want to leave the case without carrier, without a carrier, like tagged to it. So you might have to wait an additional or an additional or two hearings um, to see when the more carriers are placed at notice, renew your argument to be removed, and then the remaining carriers just hash it out by themselves. Um, so Oh, oh, also the declaration sheet, I did forget to mention that, and the policy manual, those are two things that would help us to uh, determine co co uh, coverage or support our coverage to defense also. The policy manual is something that we get from the client. It's generally not a part of the actual policy that's sent over. Um, we, uh, claimants, attorneys, and judges don't really understand what this document is, but it would contain information regarding the enrollment process, what needs to be done. Say if our argument is that the contractor was not enrolled, we can use the policy to refer to the process, um, show proof that it was provided to the employer, they did not complete the enrollment program, or um, you know, in the alternative that they were enrolled for only a particular job site and it was documented in the policy manual that you know they were there for only um, or, or only certain trades or a time period or a phase is actually covered in the policy the policy manual. The policy manual essentially lays out everything about the project, all of the parties, the purpose, the goal, uh, the different phases, what's expected, who's going to be enrolled, who's not going to be enrolled, and so forth. So those are all the documents that we need. Just a reminder, we should get a witness keyed up, whether it's an underwriter or someone to testify regarding the enrollment log. Arguments should be made from the very first day. Unfortunately, we've had some cases recently um, where prior counsel just sat back and waited for the trial to come along to make their arguments. The client's upset because it's been a year in, they're paying legal fees and um, they haven't been removed from the claim. So we're now trying to like clean those up. And we've had successes with ones where we get all the information from the very first day, we go into the hearing, and we're making progress slowly, if not at the very first hearing, but not waiting until the actual trial, which could be several months, a year. I've seen them like a year and a half later, that the judges are still holding on to carriers just because they don't have their documentation. They're not making the arguments. They're just kind of like going along for the ride. That's not something you should do because you need to close up that claim. 
you need to curb your legal expenses in that claim and then move on to the ones that actually really matter, the ones that need your time, energy, and resources um, to defend. So that's all I have for coverage today. Um, I tried to make that really simple and straightforward. It, 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 it really is as long as you understand how the wrap-ups work, how the OSIPs work and the CSIPs and the, the differences between them, and also what, what the claim is for which your policy is tagged and the information that's needed in order to defend against it. So if you have any questions, type them into the box. Let me see if anything comes up in my end. All right, I don't see any questions. If anything comes up, feel free to give me a call or send me an email. I'd love to chat with you. Um, next month, oh, not sure what's going on with my slides, but next month we're going to continue this. We're going to talk about um, a little bit about Kelly and Burns and why it matters in the wrap-up situation. So even though it's not, um, a regular situation where you are reserving your Section 29 lien rights or you're trying to do a settlement, as you generally try to do a global settlement under a wrap-up situation, you should be taking your Kelly and Burns lien rights uh, into consideration because that would help reduce exposure when you're making calculations as to whether to do a full lien waiver, partial lien waiver, or how to negotiate settlement. So we'll talk about that and how it works in construction claims. Um, so I'll see you here next month. It'll be November 6th, um, the first Monday in November. I hope I got that date right because my slides just froze. Um, but there you go, yes, November 6th. We'll talk about that. It's, the, it's always the first Monday of the month that we do the webinars. Um, if you have any ideas or topics for webinars you'd like to see in the future, I'm also taking ideas for future webinars, so feel free to reach out to me. Um, I can definitely tailor one. I like to change things up. We do have a, um, a, a yearly calendar of topics, but I can certainly change it up if there's interest in another topic. All right, enjoy October, enjoy Halloween. Summer weather is here again. Um, but when it starts getting cooler again, definitely go out and enjoy the crisp weather, and I'll see you here next month. Thank you so much.